please welcome Karim Khan and Stephen Griffin. Thank you very much, Mario. Thank you to the organising committee for the opportunity to be involved. Thanks, Stefan, for volunteering to be part of this talk. And we've had an incredible couple of days, and I know you have a lot going through your mind, potentially starting with what the hell of all those facts. Um, what am I going to do in the clinic tomorrow? It's very difficult, right? It's very difficult. There's a lot of information here. And so I'm going to share a biased perspective of some things I got out of it. Now, this is a narrative review. I think it's, it's a case series, really. It's a low level of evidence. Um, but um, hopefully it'll shed some light. And if we've got time for the discussion, we look forward to hearing from you as well. So the good news is that uh, Claire Arden, Mario Bazzini, I'm not sure if you've heard of Mario Bazzini, but he's a Swiss uh, physio, and uh, Roald Barr, um, he's a new recruit uh, coming to Aspata, um, have written the main points that I want to make in this editorial, and uh, it's online first in the BJSM, so I recommend uh, this to you. And those of you on Twitter, um, there'll be a link there, and it'll be on Facebook, care of Stefan in no time. So I think this is um, a very thoughtful editorial by these authors, and I'm thankful for them. And I'm going to take you through the key questions that they addressed in that in turn. So I want you to think about the last couple of days. So yesterday morning from the video onwards, what have you learnt about how can we determine when the athlete's ready to play? And one thing um, that I think is fundamental I want to go back to is the, the three circles, or one we call it Sackett's three circles. So Sackett was part of this model. You know the model, evidence-based practice. But the reason I'm going back there is that we're sort of downstream from that in these talks. And the risk of being downstream from that is that um, we can be focused on the research too much. So people can be saying, you know, there's all these studies, but how does that apply in real life? Or sometimes the researchers can be skeptical and they say, um, Kevin Wilk you know, gave me a bunch of fantastic normative data in throwing sports but which of these predict injury? And Eric got us to really think we have to follow those sort of um, studies forward and see if these things predict injury. Just saying that you know, Kevin Wilk's data are outside the normal range doesn't mean that this person is vulnerable for injury. So that's why I'd say you know, there's clinical expertise, there's the research evidence and the patient concerns. They've all come up in this meeting. And so let's just keep that in, in the background. And then in this editorial that I'm trying to bring to your attention, those three circles have been extended. So that's the clinician, your clinical experience, the research evidence, and the patient's perspective. And then this authors have skillfully brought in issues that apply to return to play. So in the evidence part, they've talked about load test which is the focus for the next meeting in Belfast that we just heard before the break, right? So there's going to be a whole meeting on loading and load management and the load association with injury is unbelievably hot right now. Can I get a show of hands? Who's heard of Tim Gabbard? If I say the word Tim Gabbard, put up your hand if you've heard of Tim Gabbard. So put up your hand nice and high, those of you. So that's like 24%. And so that's interesting. Because I guarantee you, when we do this in six months' time, that'll be 44% or 64%, okay? So Tim Gabbett um, has got very interesting data because he has the loading data on professional football teams and he has the injury data on football teams and uh, cricket as well. And he's put those together and he's starting to come out with a range of what's dangerous in training. And by the time we hit uh, Monaco in 2017 in uh, March, and we hit this next World Physio meeting in uh, Belfast in 2017, um, we'll have made a lot of progress. A little preview, the point today is that these things aren't mutually exclusive, um, there's, there's benefits. So when we have the evidence from the load, then the coaches will be able to apply that and uh, reduce injury risk. So that's just one example. Um, the return to play decision involves physical exam and uh, readiness for play, we heard about that. And then, 
the patient issues, we heard about the brain a lot more, and I'm going to come to that. And then with Ian Schreyer's start model, we're saying that there's liability issues and uh, ethics issues. So, you know, when you have different models, it can be thinking, well, will I go with model A or model B? Just go with the model that works for you. So if one of these models resonates for you, then it's like, yep, I get it. And if one of them doesn't, you know, just forget about it. But the purpose of the model is to help you not to miss a part. So when you're going, should this player return to play? It's like, well, am I taking the evidence into account? Am I taking, you know, my skills into account? Am I taking the patient's um, thoughts into account? And we heard that in a bunch of different talks. I think you'll, you'll agree. Okay, so it's fine. Okay. So what Ian's done very skillfully, and I think you'll agree, is that he's brought those big picture models down to the sport level, and we heard a lot about the start model. So I'm going to recommend that as um, something to read the paper again. It's a complicated paper, to be, you know, to be fair. You can't pick it up just on what we've heard here. I'm going to read it again, and I've read it a few times already. Um, but I think it's a fantastic step forward, and if you think about it, it is very logical, as Ian highlighted, the tissue has to be right. So if the person still had a broken leg, then you wouldn't think of getting them into the game. So it's like, yep, that makes sense. And then Ian made the point that if they're going to play, be playing chess or they're going to be playing rugby, then that's very different. So that's the second category, what sort of stress is it going to be under? And then Ian very nicely illustrated the difference between someone who's playing in something that's not that important or, in his case, a million-dollar contract situation. So he illustrated that beautifully, and so I'm just underscoring, refreshing, hopefully, and saying, conceptually, Ian, those three steps are easy. And then these examples are beautiful, but each one could have another explosion of points going off it. That's the thing. This tree diagram can get more and more complicated. And so our challenge is to make sure we take those things into account. But um, congratulations on the model. I think it's a massive step forward, like the Van Mechelen model moved uh, injury prevention forward in 1992-1993. And uh, this 2015 work, and Ian wasn't the first author on the, the 2010 paper, but he was being a fantastic mentor for a graduate student and uh, making sure the student got credit, but uh, was very much leadership from Ian in both of those models. So I recommend this 2015 version now. You know, it's evolved, it's the version 2.0, and uh, so a massive piece of work. And we heard a lot about it. It was brought in into a lot of talks, so my, one of my take-home suggestions is uh, to read that paper again. Now, <clears throat> um, speaking about graduate students and fantastic young students, um, I tried to get Stefan Griffin to do all the work and then for me to take the credit, but he insisted on coming on the stage. He said, I'm absolutely not going to do all that work for you unless you give me a spot on the stage. So, Stefan, if you want to come up, um, that would be great. And so I've asked Stefan to give you his take. So he's a medical student at Birmingham University, so congratulations on Birmingham for letting him go from the university. There's some people who have to get exit permits when they leave the place they live, but. Uh, uh, in Birmingham, apparently, it's OK. And he got uh, release from uh, his medical school, and it's official, so you can tweet about him. It's, he's not, it's not under the radar. But uh, it was like, OK, what did you get out of uh, Claire Arden's keynote? Take it away. Thanks, Karim. Yeah. Yes. Um, thanks, thanks uh, Mario, yeah. um, for, for, for allowing me. I can promise you I didn't insist on speaking. I haven't got an ego. Um, <laughs> You, can th you guys can think of me as the half-time act. So in the UK, during big sporting events um, or matches, what tends to happen is after the superstars go off for half-time for um, the comfort of the changing rooms, they bring out someone you've never heard of uh, at half-time. So this is just the half-time entertainment before Kareem comes out for the, se for the second half. Um, but as mentioned, Kareem asked me to um, really summarize what I took out from the session yesterday um, on ACLs, really. And I think what I re really enjoyed and what made it a lot easier for me is thinking about Sarah, um, who Claire mentioned originally, and it's also in this, um, in this fantastic uh, editorial. So Sarah is, just as a reminder, Sarah is an, uh, an undergraduate. She's a university student who's just a really keen footballer. She loves the sport, but unfortunately she ruptured her ACL. So what, where, where does the evidence stand in terms of... Um, in terms of what we, what can, 
how far is the evidence along um, so we can use it to um, good effect in, pati in patients like Sarah? Well, we know that the rule of thirds apply to those who have ACL reconstructions. So after one year, approximately a third of patients will, will have returned to sport, and two thirds will then return um, at some stage in the future. But is ACL actually required in these patients? We saw some fantastic data yesterday, but two-year follow-ups um, of those having um, had an ACL injury. The return to play rates are actually extremely similar. I think it's 44 against 39 percent in terms of those who return to sport. So is, is an operation actually indicated in this case? And likewise, do, does an operation, um, does it give you improved um, functional ability? There's so we know that um, people who under, undertake conservative management have, have, um, have regained similar physical function um, to those who've, who've gone under the knife. And even likewise, are, are functional tests actually useful? We heard a fantastic talk yesterday by Harvard, um, who mentioned that we might actually be um, using the outcome measures um, inappropriately. And are we using, using enough clinical reasoning in, um, in these cases? For instance, are we focusing too much, too much on things like symmetry, where, whereas are we focus, focusing on the absolute values? Are the absolute values um, are what they were, were at pre-injury, or are we just focusing too much on, on things like symmetry? One thing that became extremely clear yesterday was the power of the mind in ACL um, rehabilitation. And not only do we know that it's um, extremely important, but that it was great to hear about some new tools such as the ACL-RCI, questionnaire, which is also available as an app, um, and the prognostic value that this has. So again, from Havard's talk, I thought this quote was absolutely fantastic. And in terms of moving forward, where, where can we go with the research? Well, we know that the mind's important. And do we need to tell our patients, you're not a patient anymore. Now you have to become an athlete again. And it, with these psychological factors, Although we know they're important, which strategies and interventions can we use to target um, these factors affecting return to play? Which framework, strategies, and interventions are evidence-based and something that we can apply in our day-to-day -day practice? And something that I really enjoyed from Joanna Christ's talk yesterday, um, how do we improve return to play in those where there's a discrepancy in return to play rates? Are there any evidence-based approach or interventions out there that can reduce this age and gender, as well as um, level of play discrepancies? And do we, moving forward, do we need to think about return to play, especially in ACL injuries, a bit more conceptually? Do we have data available um, so that Sarah can make a fully informed choice? What, for instance, what are the risks of Sarah developing osteoarthritis if she returns um, if she returns to sport, and especially pivoting, uh, pivoting sport, sports such as soccer. Does this dec um, decrease if, if she returns to a lower level of play? Or do we really need to strip back the, the entire um, concept of return to play and stratify the return to play according to the patients we have in front of us? So if, if we see elite athletes or someone where the, that, that sport is absolutely everything to them, is it, as Robin Sadler suggested yesterday, um, is it return to performance as opposed, uh, as opposed to just to return to sport? Do we, should it be return to performance um, that's con considered a successful outcome? And in those who take their sport a little bit less seriously, is, should it be, it's not quite as catchy as RTP, I, I'll admit, but should it be return to play um, to what the patient decides? And that's what the patient decides, having been presented with the best evidence base, by clinicians free of any cognitive bias. Oh, sorry. So that's the halftime entertainment over. Thanks for the opportunity to talk. I'd just like to point you as well to this fantastic editorial, which does a much better job of addressing where the research is going. So thank you. Good job. Very nice. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Stefan, and thanks for your work on social media, among other things, uh, for BJSM. So Stefan runs our Facebook page. I call it the Facebook because I don't get that social media stuff, but uh, it's, it does a great job, and um, thank you. And Twitter account and uh, writing as well, so thank you. So interesting concept, return to play what the patient decides. Um, and it reminded me to mention this idea of return to play and return to play at the previous level. And I th I'm wondering whether we should have a simple sort of asterisk after RTP, RTP asterisk, return to play at the previous level. 
um, because we, we need to distinguish that conveniently in our discussions. And in maths, they like to put the prime, you know, so for all the people who love maths in here, you'll know that there's the prime when it's a slightly different situation. And return to play asterisk is like return to play at the previous level, which is very different to return to play um, in the sport. So it's something to think about for the group who's working on the consensus um, tomorrow. And then there's return to play, where it might be a success, it's this issue of what's success in return to play, and I'll actually get to that in a second. Okay, so if we take the first uh, bullet off the table now, we've done that, and these aren't equally balanced for time, you'll be pleased to know. Um, we move on to the second one about is physical measurement enough? Is it physical recovery enough? And I think that's been my very big take home message that uh, the mind matters. And so if we use a Twitter photo from uh, Arnlog as an introduction to Ben's concept, Ben did this very elegant, uh, very innovative model so he's he speaks quietly he's got that strange accent and so you can tend to under underestimate uh, Ben Clarson although it's probably happening less now but he comes up with these sort of models just um, while he's having breakfast and you know this is really very sophisticated in the sense that he's building in the coach and the athlete at the same time so you remember that he made the point that if we think in overuse um, injuries in the situation of potentially removing someone from play that we've got to give load a lot more credit, and that wasn't in these models before. And, of course, Ben was responsible for the overuse training model, the way of capturing overuse injuries. So for those of you who um, don't get a chance to go to conferences um, as much as some people are fortunate to, that's you, Eric, um, before there was just acute injuries and time loss injuries, and then Roald Barr and Ben have really moved this forward, saying, well, what about the players? who have got pain and they're playing, but they're, there's a lot of pain, but no time loss injury. So Ben is a perfect person to talk about overuse injuries, and then they come from this over, overloading. And so then what he's saying is that the physio is involved in this part, you know, the coaches are involved in that part. So it's a very elegant pulling together of our role. And I think that's what this sort of conference should do. It makes us think about the different people involved in the team and the different roles. Whereas when you're busy in the day-to-day -day clinic, your, your head you know, has to be in these issues just purely as a clinician, and importantly, as a clinician. So just to finish off on when is the patient ready, like there's physical measures, you know, there's mental issues. And what about imaging? The great sort of doctor hope, and I saw Ian put up people show his hands, there aren't many doctors here, so we can get away with this, Ian. Um, that you know, the big hope imaging MRI, just put Mario through the MRI and you'll know whether he's ready to return to play or not. And of course, Arnlo took that to the cleaners in a big way um, yesterday, Arnlo Vangenstein. Um, and so she showed that when you have the player at the baseline, acute hamstring injury, so bang, got the painful injury, coach and team clinician, I've got the injury, when will I be ready to play? Without the MRI, then you be predicting that uh, you'll say to the coach, look, they're going to be back within one to 51 days. It's cool, eh? Like, it won't be yesterday, so one, at least one day. This hamstring injury is going to be at least one day. And, you know, 51, like not 52, not 53, like within seven weeks, this person will be back. And so people enjoyed that yesterday because it was like, wow, that's not so helpful. Um, but that's as good as we can do at baseline. But then, of course, with the power of MRI, it's a lot better because now we can tell the coach it won't be one day um, and it won't be 51 days, don't worry. Like, within seven weeks and one day, you'll be back because we've got the MRI now. Now, for us, you know, that's probably still striking, even though you heard it, you heard it yesterday already, but it's probably striking. But if you think in a medical audience, you know, they love the MRI, and how many times have you read the newspaper, so-and-so injured, waiting MRI scan tomorrow? So the radiologist who reviewed her paper in the journal where it was published, um, you know, they had a lot of trouble over trying to say there's something wrong with this paper, don't publish it, it'll be bad for business. Um, but you know, it's a very, very striking, important finding that warrants underscore that MRI is not helpful in this situation. So. I think that's you know, a very big um, message from this meeting. And the last point 
um, with return to play instruments, we, it did come up, it's like, should there be return to play instruments? And that area is just starting. And those of you thinking about it, um, don't be confused between sport-specific return to play instruments and then generic return to play instruments. Okay, so Anne Cools, and I apologise for this being not a shoulder, upper limb focused uh, talk, I'm not good on upper limb, so um, that's my apology. It's a confession. Um, but if you have an upper limb instrument, a return to play instrument, a questionnaire, how, that, that's fine. Or if you have an Achilles one, we heard about the, the visa score from Karen Silbernagel. So there, there's a need for sport specific instruments and then there's going to be a need for a generic instrument and that's what happened in patient rated outcomes and in health economics, um, they went to generic outcomes as well. So one of the needs, I think Mario, one of the big questions we need is a, a generic instrument um, for return to play, confidence, readiness to return to play, which there isn't one yet. So those of you who are thinking about research and doing PhDs, there's a big need for a generic return to play instrument that we can compare if, across sports. Now the smart guys are down here, we don't have one of those, right? Okay, they're saying no, so that's good. Okay. And so, just two slides from uh, Mari Lundberg's great talk yesterday, and uh, she made the point that the, the pain science has advanced incredibly, and it might be good to, you know, when clinicians can work with pain scientists, I think that's a good idea to help with some of the difficult rehab. Um, people like Laura Mosley, um, David Butler making those points, Marie Lundberg herself, and so, they're saying it's we're trying to understand we're beginning to understand the difference between pain and uh, and nociception, and the fact that uh, ultimately pain is perceived in the brain. So you've got to have. Uh, so I'm going to stop there before I get into trouble on uh, pain. But I want to make the point that we've we heard here that uh, it's a complex phenomenon and it won't be improved by getting better at your knee extension exercises or proprioception. And then she brought us back to the biopsychosocial model, which again, we can pay lip service to, but ultimately it's not a lip service thing. And when you've got someone like Marie, with all her work from psychology saying, we've got to include the biopsychosocial model, um, we have Phil Glasgow saying that people can often you know, neglect the biological if they go psychosocial, or they just go biological. So it's a second really smart person saying that we've got to integrate all three. And then Gwen Jull, um, who I need to explain, you know, she made that point that she thinks the key of good physiotherapy is to not be on, these, on either extreme of this biopsychosocial model. And so I just, again, don't apologise for putting up what's somewhat a fundamental slide, but one that actually in day-to-day -day practice we can ignore and go to our favourite place. So the good clinician you know, knows when to pull in these different parts, like uses all the tools in the toolbox rather than having the one hammer and thinking that everything's a nail. Okay, so just um, you know, one of the roles in these sort of conferences is to alert to resources. And so um, Lorimer Mosley has a fantastic TED talk, uh, easy to Google. And then he has a popular podcast on BJSM um, where he talks about, he answers that question. Um, he answers the question, what's the difference between proprioception and pain? He does it in the context of tendon injuries. So Hopefully you can find BJSM podcasts easily through a BJSM app. You can download that or just on the main website. Happy to share that. Um, but a lot of good resources for physios there. And okay. Then one of the other themes, these five questions. The third one is what is successful return to play? So I just want to touch on the big picture and then the specific tests. So the big picture, um, you know, is does the person rely on their income, on, on being able to do this for their job and their self-worth and a whole bunch of reasons. So, you know, that's obviously one level of success for them. And if this person gets back and can only do half of that, you know, she wouldn't be happy. Then we had the example of Sarah, and the idea there was that Sarah is recreational and competitive and wants to be fit and dedicated, but she's not making a living out of it. And so that's a different context. We've got to plug that in. And then there's a level, you know, less active than the Sarah level, where people want about to enjoy life, and so they'd rather give up um, football. They'd rather not have a meniscal resection. They'd rather have a meniscal suture uh, to try to have a better life in the long term. 
So I'm just going to highlight a couple of Horvard Moxner's uh, slides because it comes back to successful return to play as well. He touched on return to play in uh, the Norwegian setting and his preview was that you'll be more structured in scheduling the testing because the timing matters. And he made the point about being sceptical about some of the tests. And I want to really underscore that point that I did hear quite a few, what we could almost call recipes, where folks were saying, I do this, I do this and I do that, and it can sound cool, but it wasn't, some of it wasn't mature enough yet to say, and when I act on those assessments, I can reduce injuries, or I can make safer return to play. And that was Eric Vitro's big point, um, that he was saying that if we don't have data where you've measured stuff, and then you follow those people forward to see if they either injure or don't injure, then you can't say that this is a useful test or not. So that's the challenge for FMS. You know, we heard about FMS from uh, Mike Voigt, but really it hasn't proved itself in some of the factors that people think it works for in the clinic. So we've got to be sceptical, and part of my job is to encourage scepticism, I don't apologise for that, and to be able to say I don't know. There's a lot of stuff I don't know, and there's a lot of stuff we all don't know, so we've got to be comfortable with ourselves to say we don't know, even you know, to say to the patients we don't know. And so some of these things we're doing in the clinic they might be the best we can do right now, so they don't have to apologise for doing it, but we might want to partner with the researchers or we might want to look to see how this can be evaluated further. And Eric made that point where he ended up by saying that uh, from his... We're talking about successful return to play, he made the point that uh, of these 42 people who had uh, not completed the test battery, six to one third, 16... 14, thanks very much, exactly. So there were 42 players who'd come out of the rehab who had not completed all the boxes. They just ran away from these physios, hard to believe. And then, but one third of them, the 14 of 42, ruptured their ACL. Okay, so it was just about knee injuries, ruptured their ACL. So a big deal injury in people who didn't complete the RTP criteria. Now, the question was asked, you know, which of the check boxes did they fail to complete? And he doesn't have the answer to that, but that's okay, we'll move forward. But the critical step about those data is that he knows if you, don't, if you disappear from the physio environment there in Aspatar and go back to play, you've got a one-third chance of rupturing your ACL in about a one-year window or something like that to you, like a very, very scary number. Okay? So Horvath got to that from a different angle because Horvath said, Let's, um, this is my point of being sceptical, it's sceptical about tests, like symmetry tests, we love symmetry tests, so... Remember, Horvath was telling you that for single leg counter movement jump, popular test, at six months the person was able to do 1451 on the, uh, this side, so that's the injured side. And then at the same time on the non-injured side, it was 1634. So you're there doing your clinical work and you say, you don't have symmetry, you have to stick with the rehab. So then they come back at uh, two months later and you see that it's 1625 and 1679, so then the normal temptation would be to go, you've met your symmetry, good for you, and off you go. And what Horvath was saying is that that didn't gel for him, he's smart, and also he knew that the pre-injury level for this player was 18.2, so it's the argument for having screening and uh, baseline data, which many people do. And so then, um, that was the, the 97 was this situation here, obviously. So many people would say, good, you, you know, let's be really happy. We've got this person back to play early, rapidly, six, um, eight months. And then here we see this further improvement in the next two months. Critical stuff, great data. And uh, he reminded us that her pre-injury was 18.2, so she actually got better than the, from pre-injury and you know, more up with the average. So this is a critical slide. When I saw this, it was like, that's, I've never seen a slide like that before, and it makes a critical point. Thank you. Okay, and four, then five quick ones. Um, this is the sort of our role in teams, and Nikki's opening talk about physiotherapy, um, what physiotherapists do in the return to play situation and how they analyse return to play is fantastic because that hasn't been researched. Like Ian made the point that it's been often doctors and orthopaedic surgeons making these decisions. So Nikki's work, the IFSPT project um, to look at physio perception of return to play and physio contribution return to play is great. This question in the editorial is like, what's our role? 
And I would argue that we're sort of focusing on part three is an important focus in the start model when there's the pressure. It's the coach saying that this person's got to be back. It's the sponsors saying this player's got to be back. It's the player's agent saying he's got to, he or she has got to be back. And so it's just good to be alert of that. And the relevance on that one was that getting back to Horvath's talk and uh, Heger Grindham's work, this was a follow-up after ACL reconstruction, 100 people, big study, passed the tests, but if they went back at, say, five or six months, the injury risk, so this was like meniscal injury as well, is really quite high, and it went down by 24% in month six, seven, eight, up to nine, and then once it was nine, you're good to go. You didn't get any more improvement by 10 or 12. So my take home was that it's... Um, um, really important you know, to think about that and talk about that with the players. And we heard that, say, we, if you, we heard that shared decision-making. It comes back to shared decision-making that we started with, where you say to the player, look, you could go back and play this is month seven, but you know, the risk of re-injury is very high and uh, ultimately arthritis if you tear your meniscus. So you might want to wait month eight and month nine. Is it really sure? Are these two months critical in your whole life as an athlete? OK, so we're down to the last one. Should athletes ever return to play? And Ben sort of framed that nicely when he's saying, look, we've got medium-term risk, and so that's what we focus on the injury, but in the long-term, you know, is this a wise decision? So there are five questions that uh, Claire Arden, Mario Bazzini, and Roald Barr have thought about, so I commend them as experts in the field. Uh, it's been nice to have a chance to think about and to focus on this um, conference and try and integrate all the new information. I congratulate all the speakers for their work and I've had an amazing learning experience. So thank you. I look forward to meeting those who we've got time to still meet. Thank you very much.